101, you know, what the buzz? Let's talk about pollinators. Um, before I launch into this, a bit about my background and learning to promote pollinators is that I just kind of started about three years ago. Um, I do have a very dear friend who has raised bees, and so I kind of got interested through her and then kind of in what I was working on and going to lots of different conferences. Um, I met, you know, people in Pollinators Action Network and kind of started to, to follow them. So this presentation is kind of a culmination of research efforts coming from both what I was finding online, but also attending um, conferences. There's like the Pollinator Summit Conference, there's the Native Plant Conference, there's a whole host of them. So I hope you enjoy um, this presentation. Hopefully by the end of it, it'll inspire you to tell the next person that, oh, I learned a little bit more about some of these little critters that provide our food and, and give me such beautiful flowers. So let's begin. Um, <clears throat> So this was probably about a year ago that I first gave this presentation, and there were a lot of articles that were coming out about the insect apocalypse. You know, the New York Times hyper alarming study shows massive insect loss, um, you know, plummeting numbers. You've heard a lot about just how important insects are and that there's, there's, there's definitely an issue going on all around the world, not just here. You know, the UN report warns 40% of pollinators are facing extinction. And just this quote above, I, I just, you can't imagine what a world would look like without insects because it would be a flowerless world. There'd be no color, be silence, you know, no buzz or sounds. And, you know, some of the things that insects help us to do is also to, you know, decompose things on the roadside and, and they help with decaying things. And, and then to make it beautiful again, there's that cycle. So imagine that if we don't have insects, there's a collapse or decay and erosion and loss that would spread through all ecosystems. So this is why pollinators are important because without insects, there's no flowering plants and they would soon disappear. Maybe the cockroach and the dandelion would make it because they can pretty much figure out to live anywhere. Um, but, you know, Life as we know here on Earth really depends on pollinators. 85 to 90% of the world's flowering plants depend on pollinators to bloom, to create, to fruit. Um, and, you know, they play a crucial part in agriculture. It, you know, they say that one in every three bites of food that we eat is because of a pollinator. You know, even if you like cheese and milk, pollinators, you know, they, they help pollinate the fodder that our, our cows eat. You know, these um, Whole Foods has a really great, they were starting to do a really great uh, messaging about pollinators and, you know, why bees matter. Um, so, you know, it, it's important and, and people are starting to take note of it. Because um, again, who doesn't like chocolate, beer and coffee? You know, these are all pollinator dependent. You would have to say goodbye. And that's a truly sad, sad thing. Um, and food isn't all that we need pollinators for, right? Like they help with medicines, biofuels, clothes, candles, of course, uh, construction materials, recreational activities, and including design inspiration. Um, these are just a few of those items. But of course, however, pollinator decline puts all of these things at risk. And who are the pandas and polar bears of pollinators? I like to put this slide up because World Wildlife Fund has done a great job in promoting, you know, some of the keynote, spe you know, keystone species that are um, nearing extinction. And, you know, in the insect world, we have honeybees and monarchs. I'm, I'm sure many of you have, have heard um, specifically about honeybees and monarchs. You know, for the honeybee, it was colony collapse disorder. So that term isn't used as much anymore just because they kind of do know what's causing 40% um, of the hives um, that are being lost now. And I'll get into that a little bit more. But also monarchs, it's, it's sad to think that they've seen an 80% decline in their populations just in the past 20 years. But what you probably don't know, and what's even scarier than never seeing a monarch butterfly or tasting honey again, not to mention all of our food that we depend on honeybees for, but um, is the decline of 19,600 species of native bees. They're kind of the 
the unsung heroes here. You know, 3,600 species of which are just in North America. And we're gonna get Colorado specific here. 946 of those are native to Colorado. And then the researchers at CSU and CU, because insects are a really broad, um, you know, species, including uh, just bees in general, you know, they have only been able to study 7% of those 946 native bees. And of that 7%, 60% of those are endangered. So over a quarter of North America's bumblebees are at risk of extinction as well. Um, and let me just reiterate here, no pollinators means no beer, no chocolate, no coffee. And we live off of those buzzes. So we have to figure out what's happening and what we can do about it. So let's delve into why this is happening. These are kind of the top reasons. You know, we have agriculture plus urban development plus climate change. This is equaling habitat loss. Remember, habitat means food, water, shelter. And when we are putting back green in some of these places, like in urban development, there's still, you know, parks and, and whatnot. Sometimes not all green is the same. It's not high quality for the pollinators. So looking at agriculture, you know, 30, 36% of the world's land is dedicated to it. It has caused the greatest loss of insect populations. And I'm specifically talking to the large monocrop agribusinesses here because that equals low quality habitat. And of course they use a lot of pesticides. So low quality habitat and pesticides are some of the top reasons why there's habitat loss. Um, and then, you know, what's left for them there, it's the margins, the hedgerows, the roadside banks, ditches and creek banks. And with agriculture, you are seeing a lot of farmers that are starting to plant um, pollinator roads, which is the way all agriculture really needs to go. So there's definitely movement there. And then with urban development, this is both commercial and residential. You know, residential naturally prefers some of the higher quality habitat, which is along rivers uh, and, and wa other water bodies. And then what's put in is lawn, right? Um, low quality habitat. And oftentimes to maintain a, you know, a green grass lawn, it's a lot of pesticides. And then of course there's 10 to 20% of that is for, you know, parking and pavement, which there's also some thought too about how can we make parking lots um, better for pollinators too. There's a lot of work being done at um, uh, CU about that. Um, but all of this causes habitat fragmentation. So it means that nothing is connected and, you know, bees in order to, to fly to the next food source have to fly over parking lots and buildings because there isn't like a stepping off point. And then of course, there's also light pollution. So not necessarily, uh, this is mostly for like the moths and our pollinators that work at night. You know, if they can't get to their food source because light is distracting them, you know, that's also an issue. And again, in urban development, what's left for them, they've got the urban native interface, right of ways, roadsides and highway banks, detention ponds and creek banks. And then also, you know, our backyards, we can have, a lot of um, a lot of a lot of a lot to help pollinators just by looking at our backyards a little differently. So, what can we do about it? Let's first look at what is at a larger scale already happening. So, in Boulder, there was a resolution passed which uh, banned neonicotinoid pesticides in the entire city of Boulder, and that's um, you know a lot of work that's being done by by PPAN to kind of um, repeat that in other cities. Um, CDOT Pollinator Highway 76, this is a great uh, project by the Colorado Department of Transportation. This is kind of, there's a lot, there's a, quite a few pollinator highways in the country, but specifically to CDOT, this is a really great move forward. Um, and they're able to kind of look at best management practices on how they can maintain the pollinator highway on each side of our highway <laughs> that we drive on. And then also in 2014, Barack Obama, um, you know, former president, he, he did actually sign a presidential memorandum to promote the health of honeybees and pollinators. So in some ways, the CDOT project may have come from that because a lot of governmental agencies are starting to look at their projects and how could they incorporate and better create pollinator habitat into everything that they were doing. So there's movement, it's just not very fast. And so again, let's, let's start thinking about what we can do for pollinators. And again, before we think about that, sometimes it's good to know who you're, you're designing for. 
you know, in my profession as a landscape designer, you have a client and I like to think of our, you know, pollinators as the client that we're trying to design a home for. So let's start to think about who they are. But first, let's do a quick history on pollination because to know the pollinator, you have to know why plants are so important to them and, and how that is. So first of all, what is pollination? You know, it's when a male and a female get together, you know the story. But in the plant world and with the pollinators, there's two kinds. There's self-pollination and cross-pollination. Most flowering plants rely on cross-pollination. And the two ways you do that are with wind and then pollinators who are by far way more um, efficient. In fact, bee fossil records indicate that insects and flowering plants co-evolved. Now that is a love story. So just looking below too, you see the, um, the strawberries there. That first one, you know, is pollinated by uh, insects and that is the strawberry that we know and love. You can get a strawberry with self and, and wind, but you can see that that clearly isn't a very fruitful <laughs> fruit there, it's for lack of a better word. And the story we know and love really depends on, on pollinators. Um, you know, I like this cartoon here too, because it, it's talking about mowing lawn and how you can still have a lawn, but make sure you're leaving stuff for the pollinators too, because we do need to talk about the bees and the flowers. And then just a quick lesson on, um, the the flower um this part right here is the stigma the female part and these are the anthers the male part and what has to happen another flower's uh, pollen needs to touch the stigma and so what insects do so well is to go from one plant to another and they deposit this pollen on the stigma to the, uh, from the anther into the stigma so that the reproduction occurs so attraction, you know, what is it that makes a pollinator attracted to a particular flower? It is actually physical and pheromones, um, something called pollinator syndromes. Syndromes are the characteristics of a flower that make pollinators want to go there. And oftentimes flower shapes will fit the insect's collection apparatus like a glove. You see in, the, see in the, the, the bottom here, the hummingbird, and you can tell that its beak is extending all the way in to um, the, the flower to get that nectar. And then to the side, this table is, I love this table, just because it goes through not just bees and butterflies and hummingbirds, but also some of the other lesser known pollinators like the bat, the beetle and the fly. And it will go through, you know, what color they prefer for plants. So like a bee, they really like bright white, yellow, blue, or UV. They also um, like a fresh, mild, pleasant scent. And uh, they, they also prefer shallow flower shapes with like a landing platform or also tubular. Um, Another thing too is a lot of times flowers will have what's called as a nectar guide. So this iris right here, you know, it's kind of this like bullseye, like please come, come here, come, come, come drink my pollen, drink my nectar, eat my pollen. Um, and then over here too is what bees see. So we see the yellow, but bees see this, this bullseye and like saying, this is where I'm at, you know, come, come to me. So again, you can kind of look at these, this table, and there's, there's quite a few um, tables out there now for pollinator syndromes. A year ago, it was kind of hard to find a better uh, graphic here, but I've seen a few more show up. But it's kind of neat because you can, you know, even like looking at um, the butterfly, they prefer bright red and purple flowers. They also like wide landing pads, so like a, a yarrow plant, right? They like to... Um, be able to land and, and move their feet around. Um, so now let's talk about who are these pollinators. And we're going to start with the bees. These are our top pollinators out there. The honeybee, which let's remember it is not native, it does come from Europe, but since it was brought over, it has become responsible for 90% of blueberry and cranberry uh, pollination and 95% for almonds. And then another cute 
interesting fact about the honeybee too is that they do this waggle dance to communicate that food is nearby and they can communicate that up to 165 feet from the hive. Um, next, we have a bumblebee. Um, this particular one pictured is the Colorado bumblebee, Bombus nevidensis. Um, I, cool fact, bumblebees are responsible for tomato crop pollination. They do this thing called buzz pollination. And you can imagine when you've heard a, a bumblebee pass by you, that that buzz, when it's right by that anther, it's gonna shake it so much that the pollen is released. And tomato plants need that in order to, to release their pollen. Uh, and, they, and they also are, um, they do a zigzag flight to find a nest. And they tend to do ground nests in wood holes. And then we've got the sweat bee. This is the super tiny one, um, but it, that iridescent color is unmistakable. You'll probably see quite a few of these when, if you're out in your flowers looking for them. You know, pictured here, it's the smallest of Colorado's local bee species. They actually get their name from uh, liking to land on your skin. Um, they like that salt on there from your sweat. Um, and they're excellent pollinators of smaller flowers, um, which are often bypassed by the larger, you know, honeybee and bumblebee. So they're super important. And again, go out and try to see them today. <clears throat> Next, we have some not so well known bees. We've got <clears throat> the leaf cutter bee, Ashley Name. You can see he's carrying a leaf uh, to his nest. You can also see it in some of your, your rose leaves and, and some, some other plants, that like perfect circle, you know, that's them getting fodder for their nests. Um, and then they also will, will use the pithy stem of plants. This is why it's important that you don't cut down your, your plants right away in the fall, so you can leave those stems um, available to put nests in there. And they are a generalist pollinator, so they're gonna do wildflowers, fruits, and vegetables. Next, we have the mason bee, again, aptly named. Um, they prefer to use, you know, mud and they build their nests out of um, uh, mud and leaves. And most common is the orchard mason bee. And as you can tell, it does a lot to pollinate the spring fruit trees, uh, hence why it's called the orchard, or orchard mason bee. They're short lived though, and they don't go more than 100 yards from their home or food source. So again, when we're thinking about uh, habitat fragmentation, if you wanna provide um, you know, good pollinator habitat for the mason bee, you've gotta make it you know, their next food source not more than 100 yards away. Um, and they're considered one of the gentler bees. You know? A lot of people get worried about stings and that, that mostly happens from wasps and then honeybees kind of get the blame for it. So honeybees do sting when they're protecting their hives. But a lot of our native bees, they, they're, they, don't, um, they don't sting uh, and, and are considered quite a bit gentler because they have their solitary bees. Um, and then finally, the squash bee, um, this is a specialist pollinator, as you can tell again from its name, that it pollinates squashes and cucumbers. They're also solitary, non-social bees, and they're gregarious ground nesters. So, when we talk about hives for honeybees, a lot of these native bees, these solitary bees, they actually are, a lot of them are ground nesters, um, which is why you also, we are also starting to think more about leaving bare earth in our gardens so that um, these sorts of pollinators can find a home. Um, and I think a really cute little fact there is that in early morning, they tend to do most of their foraging and you can find the male bee asleep in the petals by noon. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about the life cycle and why we're not only talking about food for our pollinators in the form of plants, flowering plants, we're also talking about their shelter and, and water needs too. So looking over, um, at the solitary bee life cycle, you know, you've got in the spring, the adults emerge and they're collecting um, pollen and to provision their nests. They're mostly ground nesters, so if you've dug a little hole, she has dug a little hole, put an egg in there, the larva grows, and then in the winter, they're, you know, growing and in the spring they emerge and start the cycle all over again. Butterflies are a little bit different because, um, not only do they need nectar source, but because of where they lay their eggs and they're young, 
they actually need something called host plants. So that's a plant that only um, that is specific to a particular butterfly where they will only lay their eggs on this particular plant because that is the only leaf that their babies or caterpillars will eat in order to grow strong and create their own chrysalis and start the whole process over again. So it's important to understand what the needs are of these pollinators um, and to understand their life cycle. You know, bees have various kinds of nests from decaying wood to the ground, hives, holes, even stream banks. Butterflies need a host plant for their caterpillars. And grasses and twigs are excellent because they hang their chrysalis from that. So again, you don't want to cut your grass and your stems down in the fall. You really want to wait until spring to do that because a lot of times some chrysalis will be overwintering. So a little bit about butterflies that you may, may know of. Um, the painted lady. I don't know who here remembers, but like three years ago, there was so many painted ladies that satellite images could actually look down and see these clouds. And that was all painted ladies doing their migration. You know, they're called the cosmopolitan because they are the most widely distributed butterfly across the world. They look quite similar to monarchs, but they are different. And um, they are also sometimes called the thistle butterfly because thistles are their host plant. Again, they need host plants, the thistle, in order to lay their eggs on so that their caterpillars can eat it. They also enjoy hollyhock, mallow, milkweed, aster, and most plants that are about three to six inches in height. Next, we have the Western Tiger Swallowtail. Swallowtail. This is a very large butterfly that you'll often see with that four inch wingspan. Their host plant are the leaves of cottonwood, aspen, willow, wild cherry, and ash. And they also like nectar from thistles, but they, they enjoy zinnias, albalia, penstemons, and also milkweed. Um, and their chrysalis actually overwinter, and they'll use twigs and also tree bark. And finally, the last kind of more common butterfly I'll share is the Colorado blue hair streak. This is actually the Colorado state butterfly. A class of fourth graders in Aurora actually got that designated in 1996. Now, this butterfly is a little interest, interesting. Um, they're not, they, they probably, you probably wouldn't call them as much of a, a pollinator as some of the other butterflies simply because they actually eat tree sap and raindrops. Uh, aphid honeydew, um, but their host plant, if you want to see the Colorado blue streak, hair, the blue hair streak, is you want to plant gamble oak. That's the only plant that they lay their eggs on. Uh, so the gamble oak is very important to um, that hair streak. So the next are the pollinator night shift. You know, these are the moths, uh, the ones that take over pollination when, when all the other uh, pollinators have gone to sleep. Um, my One of my favorite moths, which I've never seen actually, is the fire moth. I love this picture here. It's on its host plant, the um, Galaria aristata. And again, it, it needs this plant in order to survive. And this particular moth is actually endemic to Jefferson, Boulder, Gilpin, Summit, and Larimer counties. It's not found anywhere else. Um, and you can tell that it's kind of grown with the plant because it looks like the plant, right? Um, really amazing um, what some of these insects and plants have done um, to co-evolve together. Next, we have the hawk moth. You've probably heard this and, and mistaken it for a hummingbird. You know, like the swallowtail butterfly, it has a four inch wingspan. And this is among the fastest flying insects out there at 30 miles per hour. Their favorite plants, viburnum, snowberry shrubs, these are their host plants. They also are very much attracted to morning glories, penstemon, and bee balm. And you'll tend to find them feeding at dusk and dawn. And then, of course, unfortunately, the caterpillars, the horn worms, have been known to be pests to tomatoes. So um, we got to think about that, too. If you want hawk moths, think about the tomatoes. Um, and then finally, the yucca moth, which you probably haven't heard a lot about, but this one's similar to the fire moth in that it really only uh, pollinates the yucca. But you can say thank you to the yucca moth because they are the ones that are um, responsible for, uh, let's see, wait. The yucca plants depend on the, the yucca moth for its survival. Um, and then like in Joshua Tree in the Spring Mountain National Rec Area, they'll, they not only use collected seeds to repopulate the Joshua trees, but they also have to 
to help grow the, the moss and make sure that they're there to pollinate. I got ahead of myself with this. I'll, I'll tell you what I was going to say in a second. Um, so finally, we've got um, some of the bird species that do pollination. The long distance pollinators are the hummingbirds. Here in Colorado, we have the calliope and the broadtail. So we've got the calliope, that's the smallest bird in North America, with only being three inches long. So that's like smaller than the butter, the, the hair, the butterfly, the swallowtail, and the, um, the moth there. So that's kind of crazy. But despite their size, they actually survive very well in the cold summer nights in the Northern Rockies. And they do a 5,000 mile round trip migration. Um, and then if you want to see more of these, their nest sites, you need to plant pine, conifers, deciduous shrubs, um, and they tend to, to make their nests in the top of pine cones or a cup of a plant down. And then the broad tail, this is very more, a little bit more common and widespread, but surveys are indicating that they are in decline. Um, they're kind of known for that, that kind of wing trill that you'll hear when you're in the mountain that goes whoop, whoop. Um, they favor red tubular flowers. Um, and they do defend territory by perching high. And their nest site is a horizontal branch shelter from overhanging branch. So if you want some of these, you've got to have some of the taller plants so they can do that high, high perching. And then finally, the bat, that's actually one of our pollinator mammals. Um, the lesser long-nosed bat uh, is a nectar feeder of cactus blooms. And they're really important because they are responsible for making sure that we have tequila. So we, for our margaritas, we have to thank this cute little guy. Look at him covered in little fuzzy pollen all over him. Um, and that tongue is just amazing how, how long it is, again, to get into those tubular flowers. Um, so yes, thank you uh, to the long-nosed bat for my margarita that I will have after this conversation, <laughs> this presentation. And then finally, we can't end the pollinator talk without talking about flies, wasps, and beetles. Um, fly pictured here, it's the bee fly. So yes, it looks a lot like um, a bee, but it is a fly. And they're responsible for pollinating strawberries, onions, and carrots. So uh, similar to the sweat bee, you know, they, they do the smaller flowers. They're important pollinators in colder climates, so in the Arctic and the Alpine. And even your house fly is a pollinator. They, they actually pollinate your carrots. And uh, with fly larvae, generally they are parasitic. Um, they'll eat other insects like caterpillars and bee larvae, but you know, it is an entire full ecosystem here. So, um, you know, that's important as well. And then wasps, you know, some, some wasps you, you feel like are just a nuisance, but we do need them. Um, this is the pollen wasps here that you see. You know, and actually, I didn't know this after researching, but evolutionarily, bees are just um, vegetarian wasps. So they're very similar. Um, wasps that are pollen collecting kind, um, they do have hairs for fur plants from the water leaf and figwort families. Um, potter wasps, though they're not pollen collecting, they'll eat the forest and farm pests. So like your spruce budworm and alfalfa beetle. So they're very important, not necessarily for transfer of genetic material, but for um, getting rid of the unwanted pests. And then finally, um, the beetle, that is also a pollinator. Here's the soldier beetle. Um, you know, they are considered actually the Earth's first pollinator. So um, they do this kind of um, mess and soil sort of pollination. So they kind of climb up on that flower and just kind of move around and just mess everything up and then they, they poop and, you know, the rest is history. So um, they are attracted to smells and are especially important pollinators for more of our ancient species. So like magnolias and spice bush. And they prefer either large flowers or flower clusters like spirea so they can get up there. It's similar to how butterflies like yarrow to a, a flattened flower. Um, so just a few key plants for pollinators. Because again, you know, kind of you learned about the um, the flower syndromes that you know plants and their shapes and their colors play a huge part in attracting specific pollinators. Um, you also are kind of learning that some pollinators, uh, some butterflies, particularly need certain host plants. Um, so these are just some of you know a broad overview of some of my favorite plants that you should include in your garden. Um, but again, there's so many out there. 
and, and you'll see on the next slide, they'll have some resources you can look at. But underneath each of these plants, it kind of shows um, when they bloom and when um, and what type of pollen you're like them. So the Grand Mesa beard tongue, you know, that is going to be spring, summer. you got bees and hummingbirds. I love wine cups, that big cup shape, um, you know, bees love, but also butterflies like as well. You know, and again, that's similar to bloom time is the, the beard tongue there. Um, the Rocky Mountain bee plant aptly named, um, bees and butterflies, the summer bloomer. And then we're kind of moving into the fall where you've got your aster. Again, those are bees, moths, butterflies, that open flower, they can land there uh, and get the nectar and the pollen. Um, remember, grasses are really important, especially for um, butterflies um, and moths because that's where they'll hang their chrysalis. So blue grandma grass is a great native plant. Blue flax as well. Um, blanket flower, you remember the fire moth that needs um, the blanket flower to be able to reproduce. Everyone loves the purple cone flower. Again, it has a big open face. You know, now we're bringing in hummingbirds really like this plant. Um, rabbit brush is another great native species. It's gonna bloom all the way into the fall. It's some of the last um, food sources for pollinators. And then you kind of end with the blue stem again. You know, this is, this is a great plant to keep. Um, don't cut it down until the fall because it will give you winter interest in your yard that beautiful kind of, you know, bluish green color, but it also is um, post plant uh, that will provide, you know, overwintering chrysalis a place to, uh, to grow. Um, so yeah, the final kind of key points on designing pollinator habitat. Again, habitat is food, water, is shelter. We talked a little bit about the food with the slide before with the plants, but some of the other things to think about is, you know, not not cutting back your grasses until um, and, and your some of your plants too until the spring. So you're providing the the pithy holes for the mason bees um, and for chrysalis to hang from. You want to think about creating plants that can bloom all season. So in that last slide, we talked about some of the early bloomers all the way to the late bloomers. You know, leave dead wood and and, and bare earth too because again, you've got. Um, especially some bee species that, you know, they, they're ground nesters. Um, again, color a variety of plants. And also you wanna think about planting in swaths in groups of plants. And that means that it'll be easier for, you know, pollinators to kind of just stay with the same plant before they move on uh, to the next. For instance, honeybees, they tend to just forge one kind of plant for each flight they take out from their hives. Um, so the closer, you know, their food is to each other, the less energy they're spending. Um, but again, these are some images that I gathered from, from the internet um, that you can go and, and, re and see some of these, uh, um, you know, practices for yourself. Um, these are some of the, those uh, websites that I got this information from. And it's just, it's kind of beautiful, some of the posters that are out there and you can get these printed and hang them up in your offices. Um, so I just highly recommend, you know, getting, getting the opportunity to go check out some of these websites. If you're here in Fort Collins, the Nature in the City program is great. I'm volunteering with them too, to kind of um, help folks with native plant suggestions and uh, a great way to, to be able to help fund putting pollinator habitat into your backyard. Because again, we can do a lot just in our backyard, but in addition to, you know, planting, uh, native plants you also want to start talking to people about why it's important and get your neighbors involved so then you're creating your backyard is then part of everyone else's backyard and it's a highway for pollinators to be able to find food and shelter and water um, another quick thing too is that if you don't have a creek in your backyard like i do you know you can put out um like a bird bath but put some rocks and stones in there so they have butterflies and uh these have a place where they're not like drowning in the water and they can go and sip the water because water is very important. So I think um, that's it. <laughs> Hope you enjoyed this presentation. We'll have 